stand in wonder once again. Your grace still amazes me. Your love is still a mystery. Each day finish up our afternoon and um, then we'll be back for one more meeting tonight uh, to finish up at seven o'clock tonight but um, our last meeting this afternoon Ron Duffield is going to present there shall be time no longer um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time online Ron is a um, respiratory therapist in Washington state he has Bernie's mountain dogs and breeds them with great Pyrenees and has these amazing puppies. And so Ron's gonna let me know next time they have a litter. But uh, I really appreciate uh, all that Ron does and his um, thoroughness with understanding history. He has published a number of books, Return of the Latter Rain being the most prominent. So Ron, welcome back. I'm gonna let you start and have your own prayer. I wanted to um, just make a couple comments uh, before we officially start. And that is that I, I do want you to know I would rather stand up here and talk about revivals. Um, in fact, uh, where's D? I saw him just a little bit ago. I, this last summer I was actually reading um, and ran across a revival the summer of 1895 in South Africa and uh, amazing. S.N. Haskell was there, that the ground literally shook. He wrote a letter to Ellen White. There was little kids actually converted in this incident. He wrote to Ellen White and her response, it, it was been unpublished until 2015, never read it before. It was just amidst her response was just point blank. This is the latter rain summer of 1895, right before the Armandale sermons, which um, Dee mentioned earlier. So with that, uh, I will have prayer, and then we'll, uh, a few more introductory remarks, and then we'll start in for this afternoon. So, Father, as we begin tonight, I just, uh, this evening, this afternoon, I pray, Lord, again, that you would be here, that you would uh, guide our thoughts, and Lord, guide my words. And Lord, may we see in what's presented tonight a, a warning to us as a people to stick with the real thing. I pray, Lord, that you will uh, convict us and um, help us, I pray, as we are living in this incredible time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So last night was the first part of 
uh, I called it the introduction to a talk called Time Shall Be No Longer. And when I found out that, you know, the, th the theme was um, it's midnight, time for most precious message, and there are just going to be talks about the three angels' messages and righteousness by faith, I thought, you know, um, I was going to prepare something along that line. And over a couple uh, month period there, I was impressed that, you know, there's some other things that maybe need to be talked about as a warning to us that we don't get distracted from that most precious message. And I may be preaching to the choir here, but I do believe that somebody within the hearing of my voice, I pray, would be impressed to put aside some of these things that uh, tend to uh, detour us. And I will get into a little bit more of that as we get going here tonight. Last night, we talked about the Millerite movement and the prophecies that were fulfilled. And I'll just start with this kind of summary statement that Ellen White makes in the Spirit Prophecy Volume 4, where she says, the Advent movement of 1840 to 44 was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. The first angel's message was carried to every missionary station in the world, and in some countries there was the greatest religious interest which has been witnessed in any land since the Reformation of the 16th century. So that Millerite movement was not just some passing thing. This was an enormous religious awakening. She continues, but these are to be far exceeded by the mighty movement under the last warning of the third angel. And really, that's what we're looking for today. And the devil knows that, and that's why he's doing his best to take us this way and that way. And we may think, well, I, I'm not caught up in this thing, but we may be more susceptible to something over here. The devil's got something for each of us, so we have to be humble as we are confronted with the various things that Satan does to try to distract us. Well, Ellen White um, compared this revival, like we just read, to the um, Reformation. And last night I ended with this uh, quote. I'll read it again. The preaching of a definite time for the judgment in the giving of the first message was ordered of God. The computation of the prophetic periods on which that message was based, placing the close of the 2300 days in the autumn of 1844, stands without impeachment. And I think that means that it can't be moved. It's solid. We don't have to question that. The repeated efforts to find new dates for the beginning and the close of the prophetic periods, plural, and the unsound reasoning necessary to sustain these positions not only leads minds away from the present truth, but throws contempt upon all efforts to explain the prophecies. I don't think people realize this when they want to predict the Sunday laws even or how long they might be and so forth, that reassess or reassigning the prophetic dates actually undermines the very foundation that they're trying to bring people upon. Ellen White continues, the more frequently a definite time is set for the second advent and the more widely it is taught, the better it suits the purpose of Satan. After the time has passed, he excites ridicule and contempt of its advocates and thus casts reproach upon the great Advent movement of 1843 and 44. Those who persist in this error will at last fix upon a date too far in the future for the coming of Christ. Thus, they will be led to rest in a false security and many will not be undeceived until it's too late. And I believe this happens. Some people, yeah, they may actually pass to their grave thinking, yeah, the Lord's, you know, I'll wait till then, then I'll get ready. Well, after the great disappointment, and as I mentioned last night, this Advent movement was constantly studying the scriptures, and within scripture itself, they found a description of their movement, of their experiences, and this was the case even after the great disappointment. Now, m many, the majority perhaps actually, left in discouragement, but there were those that continued to study. And they 
followed in Revelation 10, which of course comes right after, it's an interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, and here they found these words, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things therein are and the earth and the things that, are, that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer. So the t basically the title of my talk is taken from this verse, although I took it from the um, literal Greek translation, time shall be no longer. And so as the Millerite movement that came out of that disappointment, as they continued to study, they read Revelation 10 and they realized that book which that angel gave to John to eat, which was sweet and then became bitter, was our experience. And yet, there's this declaration that time should be no longer, meaning, this is how Ellen White describes it, this time, which the angel declares with a solemn oath, is not the end of this world's history, neither of probationary time, but of prophetic time, which should proceed the, precede the advent of our Lord. That is, the people will not have another message upon definite time. After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. That statement alone should forever stop anyone within our church from ever trying to pick up another date and apply it to anything because prophetic time is over. Are there events waiting to, still to happen? Yes, but they're not based on a time. They're based on the condition of God's people moving forward with him. I showed this chart last night. This, to me, tells the whole story. It ended, prophetic time ended in 1844. There's events still to happen, but they're not based on time. And we'll talk again a little bit about that 2520 uh, a little bit farther on. Last night I showed you this chart, and this is what I collected just in the last three months, just going through review articles addressing time setting since 1850 to our present time. Now again, I would make it very clear that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has never officially made any kind of time prophecy. But unfortunately, some of us as members over the last 150 years have gotten caught up into that. And the point is it distracts from the message we have. And as we will see later this, this afternoon, it actually distracted when that most precious message came the first time in the 1880s and 90s. So I want to look at just some of, rather than wait till the end, I want to show how in that day these prophecies have been reinterpreted so that we can say, look, if all of these things happened back then when Ellen White was alive and she mo openly said, no, 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 then we need to understand that if we do any of that again today, she would not be endorsing it. Even though some are standing up today, even this very year and saying, oh, I'm not time setting, this is Ellen White. No, it's not Ellen White. Reinterpretation of fulfilled prophecies, the 2300 days, all the dates, reinterpreting any of those falls under this category. Change in the starting or the ending dates or reapplying, making them dual prophecies. Changing it from a, a year day prophecy to a literal time. So it's really not 1260 years, it's 1260 days. Sunday laws will last that long. That's time setting. Predicting, a prediction sometimes based on the Jubilee cycles. This has happened, happened in the Walla Walla Valley just a couple years ago. The uh, cosmic week theory, 6,000 years, that's happening this very year, 2027 is predicted. And these are not people you've never heard of. These are big name people sometimes that are doing these things. 40 weeks, 120 years. Some predictions have to do with Jerusalem. They did in the time of Ellen White. 
and some of them Levitical feast uh, days and so forth. Time for prophecies having to do with the second coming. It's not just the second coming, though. It's the judgment of the living. When that's going to start? The close of probation. The close of probation for Adventists. The latter rain. When is it going to come? It's not based on time. It could have been here long ago. The loud cry, the stealing, the time of trouble, Sunday laws, the seven last plague, the resurrection. Any and all are not based on time. They're in a train of events which is behind a log jam based on our reception of the Laodicean message to us as a people. Claims of visions are sometimes involved in these things. Happened in Ellen White's day, has happened in modern times, and it often increases doubts concerning the spirit of prophecy in the end, even though there's claims that it's based on it to begin with. And again, here's just a summary of some of the things that happen. It creates a false excitement, temporary fervor, distraction from present truth. That's the point of what I'm talking about tonight. Disqualifies us for giving the three angels' message. Loss of simplicity in the everlasting gospel. There's a simple gospel. I said in a sermon today that touched my heart. Didn't have any graphs, didn't have any, you know, complicated calculations or anything. It was lifting up Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs. Fanaticism, traps of Satan, false paths, false security, pride, disunity, disappointment, backsliding, loss of faith, false witness to the church and the world, and contempt and unbelief. And to show you that this this was real from the very get-go, Ellen White's first vision was to stop a time, new time prophecy and to point back to that midnight cry and say, this was of the Lord. This is how she actually states about uh, what she talks about, the vision itself. She says, while I was praying at the family altar, December 1844, the Holy Ghost fell upon me and I seemed to be rising higher and higher, far above the dark world. I raised my eyes and I saw a straight, narrow path. On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the first end of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. And that midnight cry was based on time prophecy and the end of all prophetic time. We don't need to reestablish that. This light, continuing, this light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. And I think today where we find ourselves as a church and as a people sometimes stumbling is because we've gotten out of that light, looking for other light instead of standing on that pathway with that light behind us. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that that it was not of God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, which left their feet in perfect darkness And they stumbled and got their eyes off the mark and lost sight of Jesus and fell off into the path in the dark and wicked world below. And unfortunately, that was actually the result of so many that came out of that great disappointment. They denied the whole experience and before long, they were out in the world. Well, Ellen White, years later, would would again write about this first vision and, and she would apply it to time setting. Notice what she says. I was a firm believer in definite time in 1844. But this prophetic time was not shown me in vision, for it was some months after that passing of this period of time before the first vision was given to me. There were many proclaiming a new time after this. But I was shown that we should not have another definite time to proclaim to the people. All who are acquainted with me and my work will testify that I have borne but one testimony in regard to time setting. Do not stand up today and say, oh, I'm not, I'm not saying this, it's Ellen White. That's what she's saying right there. She's not saying 6,000 years is ending in 2027. That's not her testimony. I have been repeatedly urged to accept the different periods of time proclaimed for the Lord to come but I have ever had one testimony to bear. The Lord will not come at that period, and you are weakening the faith of the Adventists and fastening the world 
in their unbelief. And I believe some people are very sincere. They think they're encouraging people, but they're actually fastening them in the end in unbelief. But their oft-repeated message of definite time was exactly what the enemy wanted, and it served his purpose well to unsettle the faith in the first proclamation of time. So again, where, what is it unsettled? The original prophecy of the closing of, um, I mean, the end of the 2300 days with the whole sanctuary message uh, and settles the faith in the first proclamation that was of heavenly origin. The world placed all time proclamation on the same level and called it a delusion and fanaticism and heresy. Ever since 1844, I have borne my testimony that we were now in a period of time in which we are to take heed to ourselves so that that day come upon us unawares. Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of the Lord coming. So how many time prophecies can you squeeze in between that, those time periods? None. Well, as we have heard before, it was shortly after that disappointment that Hiram Edson, as he was walking actually away from going through the middle of town because of all the ridicule, that he was impressed with the idea that the sanctuary to be cleansed was the heavenly. And over time, he wrote that out, and this became, through Bible study, and the confirmation of the spirit of prophecy, a foundational understanding of the Adventist church. And this is how Ellen White talks about um, in Great Controversy. The majority of the Adventists rejected the truths concerning the sanctuary and the law of God, and many also renounced their faith in the Advent movement. Some were led into the error of repeatedly fixing upon a definite time for the coming of Christ. Notice this. This I had not somehow I'd missed this before last week. The light which was now shining on the subject of the sanctuary should have shown them that no prophetic period extends to the second advent. Now I want to study that more, but I think at least just initial read is that, you know, the prophecy ends, Christ goes into the most holy there's no time attached to that because it's conditional upon his work on our heart. It's not based on a time. 1846, the Sabbath was brought in through people like Rachel Oakes, a Seventh-day Baptist, Barnesworth, Wheeler, Bates. And in the summer of 1846, James and Ellen White accepted the Sabbath. And around the very same time they were married, Ellen White actually was rebaptized uh, when she began keeping the Sabbath for the first time. 1848 to 1850 were what we understand as the, the Sabbath conferences where the fundamental or the foundational truths of Adventism were studied out from the scriptures. And here's a kind of a summary statement about that. Those who passed over the ground step by step in the past history of our experience, seeing the chain of truth in the prophecies, were prepared to accept and obey every ray of light. They were praying, fasting, searching, digging for the truth as for hidden treasure. And the Holy Spirit, we know, was teaching and guiding us. The leadings of the Lord were marked and the most wonderful were his revelations of what is truth. Point after point was established by the Lord of God of heaven. That which was truth then is what? Truth today. Sometimes I don't think we appreciate the, the seriousness of that study and the experience that they went through, uh, those early Advent believers. So a statement that we've, many of us probably have all read, the passing of time in 1844 was a period of great events, opening to our astonished eyes 
the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven, and having decided relation to God's people upon earth. Notice that connection in the cleansing of the sanctuary. Also, the first and second angel's messages, and the third, unfurling the banner on which was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of transgressors of the law, God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. So again, this was kind of a sum, summary statement Ellen White made in, in 1888 of those landmarks, and she actually almost does it in the order in which they were discovered or um, studied out. So if we put those all that she just mentioned uh, in that statement and then other, th other truths that they continue to study out, of course the, the idea of the great controversy what came to much greater light, the expanded understandings of Daniel and Revelation, not just those uh, prophetic chapters that were looked at for 1844, the mark of the beast, the seal of God, the two choices at the end, time of trouble, that was an idea, uh, obviously new because they thought Jesus was just coming in 1844, that there's actually more to happen. 144,000, victory over sin, preparation for second coming, latter rain, loud cry, and the millennium and the judgment of the wicked. Well, 1849, the uh, present truth, of course, there have been magazines, I mentioned some of those last night, in the Millerite movement, but the Sabbath-keeping Adventists at this point, of course, started a paper called Present Truth. That went for only several months, and then the name was changed to the Advent Review, and within a couple months, it was changed to Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. And the point I'm making here is that from almost the get-go, this is, what, five years after the disappointment, and you have a paper dedicated to remind you of how God had led in the past, five years before. And it makes me think again today that we would do well to do more in publishing the past, now 150, 75 years later, than even then, which was only five years after the, the fact. Well, 1850, time setting again hit, and this is at a time when there were Seventh-day, uh, Sabbath-keeping Adventist. This was not, again, something that, you know, the, uh, the official movement endorsed, but there were members of that movement who did. And so um, someone was reinterpreting um, the 1335, and Ellen White made this comment in, uh, that's recorded in early writings. The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord, but it must not be hung on time. I saw that some were getting false excitement arising from preaching time, but the third angel's message is stronger than time can be. And I think, you know, when we lift up Jesus Christ aside from any time, that it has power in and of itself. That's what Ellen White, I believe, is saying here. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and needs not time to strengthen it, and that it will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. Now, of course, forgot to mention, this is really when the, the, the believers begin to see there is a message that needs to go to the world, and some wanted to attach it to some kind of time prophecy. And the answer was no, it doesn't need time. Well, in 1850, again, there was a desire then to, God showed them, to make a new chart. The Lord God gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables and it would cause many to decide for the truth. By the three angels' messages with, with the two former being made plain upon tables. God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart I saw it was needed and that the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and would cause souls to come to the knowledge of the truth. So they made a new chart, different from the 1843 one. The um, sanctuary was added in there, the, the uh, Sabbath, the third angel's, three angel's messages, uh, third angel's message. Much of the rest was still in there. The 2520 prophecy, those numbers were all taken out um, and, but it was the seven times prophecy was mentioned from Leviticus 26 was mentioned up at the top, but it was much less prominent. 
Well, in 1850, there was also uh, a brother that was involved in this time-setting thing. And there's a mention that Ellen White makes of this. It's a brother, Hewitt, from Dead River. He'd written articles for um, another Advent magazine where they were setting dates and so forth. And this is what Ellen White said. Brother Hewitt from Dead River was here. He came with a message to the effect that the destruction of the wicked and the sleep of the dead was an abomination. So he obviously didn't agree with some of the truths they had studied out. We told him of some of his errors in the past. We told him that the 1335 days were ended and of numerous errors of his. But thankfully, he confessed it was of God, was humbled in the dust, and he has been writing ever since that meeting and is now writing from the same table, renouncing all his errors that he has advanced. So again, here's an example where somebody was trying to take the 1335 make it a literal time period and apply it to some event. And Ellen White said no. 1851, first time Ellen White published uh, some of her written uh, documents in kind of a booklet form. And again, the whole purpose was to, seven years after the Great Disappointment, to encourage those Advent believers to review their past. 1854, Another chart came out. Now, this was not an Adventist who made this, but there were Sabbath-keeping Adventists that were caught up in this movement. And this chart, they were redating the 1260, the 1290, the 1335, the 2300 days. And um, this is what, it actually took quite a few people by storm. This is what Ellen White responded, 1854. The fanaticism which raged in years past has left its desolating effects in the East. I saw that God tested his people upon time in 1844, but that no time which has since been set has borne the special marks of his hand. He has not tested his people upon any particular time since 1844. Considerable excitement was created by the 1854 time and many were settled have settled it that that movement was in the order of God because, notice, it was quite extensive and some were apparently converted by it. So just because you go out perhaps and, and uh, promote a new prophetic view and you get followers does not mean that it is a success. Notice. But such some conclusions are not necessary. There was much preached in connection with the time in 1854 that was reasonable and right. Truth and error, error always attaches to some truth. Some, after their disappointment, they gave up both truth and error and are now where it is very difficult for the truth to reach them. In other words, they're worse off now than they were before. Where we're, uh, there is where there is one who has been benefited by believing the 1854 time, there are ten who have been injured by it. The proclamation of the 1854 time was attended with a spirit which was not of God, and that was basically Ellen White's summary of that event. Now, each one of these ones, I'm, I'm just pulling a couple slides out of a few of these time-setting events just to give you an idea of some of these that happened in the past. 1863, the um, Seventh-day Adventist Church was formed. Here in Battle Creek, John uh, Byington was elected the first president. On May 20, 1863, uh, it was officially organized. And uh, that picture is actually from the 150th anniversary but I guess that's a replica of the church here. And the first vote they took that day as a organized Seventh-day Adventist church was to organize state conferences. So as a general conference, their first vote was let's organize state conferences. Their second vote was to come up to produce a new chart as a Seventh-day Adventist church. On the motion of Brother Wagner, it was voted 
that this conference recommend to the publishing association to publish a new prophetic chart. It was voted that we recommend to the publishing association to publish a chart of the Ten Commandments suitable for public lectures. Second vote of the organized Seventh-day Adventist Church was to produce a new chart. So they produced a chart like this on the law of God, and they produced a new chart, prophetic chart, and at the bottom right corner of that chart, it actually says Seventh-day Adventist Publishing Association. So if you wanna see a chart that's officially Seventh-day Adventist, this is that chart. Now, I don't know if there's anyone here from the historic village, but I would encourage us as a people to reproduce this chart as well. I have not been able to find this one reproduced in actual size. Because on this chart, the um, 2520 is removed. Now again, on this chart that I showed you, Himes and Miller believed that in Leviticus 26 and, and uh, Daniel 4, the seven times referred to the judgments on Israel and that ended in, in uh, 1798 or 1843. But as Adventists organized, they, I believe they realized, you know, that, that time is not, we don't need that to strengthen the whole 2300 day sanctuary prophecy and that was removed. So you have the 1843 chart where you have very, very noticeably the 2520. On the 1850 chart, it's very small, you don't see it. On the 1863 Seventh-day Adventist chart, it's removed. The only reason I mentioned that is there has been a big deal about this 2520. It's very much alive in the Walla Walla Valley so here's a picture, 1864, of James White beside that actual Ten Commandment chart. And a few months later, he actually wrote something about the 2520. Very kindly written, but he, he wrote on there, the prophetic period of Leviticus 26 has been supposed that the expression seven times denoted a prophetic period of 25, 2,520 years. There is no prophetic period in Leviticus 26. And those who imagine that such a thing exists and are puzzling themselves over the adjustments of several of its dates are simply beating the air. To ignore or to treat with neglect a prophetic period where one is plainly given is censurable in the extreme. It is an equally futile, though not so heinous, a course to endeavor to create one where none exists. And so, as an Adventist church, that date was set aside. Now, some today have gone so far. I just received this last week, a video on the, promoting the 2520, and they photoshopped the 1843 chart onto the, ninth, you know, the 1864 chart to promote the 2520 today. Something else came up, same year, interesting, 1863, same time, uh, James White writes about doing away with the year-day principle. All of these things happened in their day and again, happened in our day. Judge then of our surprise when we read not long since in the world crisis, a, a periodical, from the pen of one who stands high with many as a leader and instructor of the people, an argument to prove that the prophetic periods of Daniel are literal days, not years. An argument which we can regard no less than a deliberate attempt to raise to its very foundation one of the main pillars of the Advent faith. And again, this is another area. When we try do away with the year-day principle, we are falling into that counter-reformation camp that happened back in the 1600s to try to take pressure off the church, day, the church of that day. 1883, another time-setting wave hit the church. A brother Owen came down from Canada and he had new light, he thought, on the trumpets. Believe they should be literally 
not the pro prophecy that ended in 1840 he didn't agree with. So he came down and they elected a committee to look at what he had to say, and this is how it's reported in the review. The committee of 10 appointed to consider the subject of the seven trumpets then reported as follows. Your committee appointed to consider a new exposition of the prophecy of the seven trumpets of Revelation 8 and 9 would respectfully report that they see no occasion to change from the views we have formerly entertained, especially as the purpose, proposed view is, in their judgment, unscriptural and would unsettle some of the most important and fundamental points of our faith on period. On motion, the above was adopted and as the sense of the conference. So this was an official vote on this view of this R.S. Owen. Well, eight months went by, and obviously the, the matter hadn't been settled. Uh, Mr. Owen and his followers were obviously still pushing this, and they were claiming that the conference hadn't really had an opportunity to look at it, and the people who voted didn't know what they were voting on. So the review again issued another statement. We understand the impression is going abroad that the new theory on the subject of the seven trumpets suggested at our last general conference was not disapproved by the committee appointed to examine it, and that the report of the matter which appeared in the review was made by one who had not heard the subject presented. In correction of any such impression, we would say that the report received the approval of each member of the committee after personal examination. It was introduced in open meeting and endorsed by the conference, and the secretary gave the report just as it was furnished him. The matter was disposed of exactly as it appears in the report of the conference proceedings. In other words, what we voted stands as our decision, and we are not going to change the view of the trumpets. Now, the reason I bring this up, and maybe I'll read this statement from uh, Great Controversy first. 1884, Ellen White had just put out Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, which was the Great Controversy. So it would have been too late to obviously put something in that book. But four years later, after this incident with Owens and a few others, this, a couple paragraphs appeared in the Great Controversy, 1880 edition, about Josiah Litch and this prophecy. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of the prophecy excited widespread interest. Two years before, Josiah Litch, one of the leading ministers preaching the Second Advent, published the, an exposition of Revelation 9 predicting the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The prediction was widely published, and thousands watched the course of events with eager interest. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known, multitudes were converted of the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates, and a wonderful impetus was given to the Advent movement. So 1888, Ellen White adds that to her book in support of Josiah Litch's interpretation of that prophecy and the one that the church had stood on. And the reason I bring that up is because Brother Owen didn't give up on that idea. In 1912, he was in Battle Creek and he decided to publish his ideas. In 1914, the review formed a board to look at the seven trumpets and the conclusion of the men on that board was, we can't support that view anymore. Five years later, that view came up at the 1919 Bible Conference as one of the issues of whether we can trust Ellen White's historic accuracy. You see where this goes? And so the choice is, if we have a new view and Ellen White supported that view, who's right? Well, we like the new view. That means her historic accuracy is in question. And last year, we celebrated 100 years of that conference by producing books that are questioning her authority on an ever-increasing basis. I read one place, the Great Controversy is probably only 50% accurate. That was one person's assessment. And this is where it started, the seeds. 1884, again, another brother, Brother Raymond. And this is the Walla Walla Valley. This is actually a a stencil from that very year, 1884, of the Blue Mountains. I actually live somewhere up in those Blue Mountains. 
Brother Raymond was never, has never been in harmony with his brethren. He has some new light on Revelation. I told him that when my brethren, as did Brother Owen, came up with new light, he almost made me have an agoo chill. I guess that's like a malaria type chill. For I knew it was the device of Satan, which no one could understand, although a man declared it unto them. It is a sure case that Satan throws a bewitching power into their new views they take with minds, although the arguments are as clear as mud, disjointed and out of harmony with the message. And I don't think Ellen White was being flippant here. She saw the kind of devastation that these kind of things brought into the church. And what Brother Owen was promoting, Brother Raymond picked up in Walla Walla, and same idea. But notice what she says here. Brother Raymond has done a work that was tearing down. New views after the order of the views of Brother Owen presented to the Council for Examination. From that which the Lord has been pleased to show me, there will arise just such ones all along and many more of them claiming to have new light which is a side issue an entering wedge the widening will increase until there is a breath breach made between those who accept these views and those who believe the third angel's message and i have seen this happen in my lifetime people start out on something like this and before long they're completely out of the church It is Satan's object now, still in this letter about Brother Raymond, it is Satan's object now to get up new theories and divert the mind from the true work and the genuine message for this time. He stirs up minds to give false impressions of Scripture a spurious loud cry that the real message will not have its effect when it does come. And here's my whole point. This is of the greatest evidence that the loud cry will soon be heard and the earth will be lightened with the glory of God. This was 1884. And there's other statements that Ellen White had made like this. God, I think she knew God was showing her there was light coming And the devil knew it too, and this is what he was doing to try to detract, one of the things he was doing to detract. And I believe it's the same today. We're living in a time with COVID and all the chaos, and it excites us to start looking around to find something to explain where we're at in prophecy and so forth. We need to go back to the message the Lord has given us. Amen. 1884, another. And this is what I find. It increased when the loud cry came. Brother Garmeyer, he's from Colorado. He stole the mailing list from the review and he printed a paper called Another Angel Came Down from Heaven. Do you know where that's quoted from? Revelation 18, verse 1. Stanton, 1893, his book was called The Loud Cry. It's a counterfeit. Satan's trying to get in there at a counterfeit. I am compelled to state that I have not had the least faith in Brother Garmeyer or his work. The pamphlet that was issued last fall at the time of our Jackson camp meeting had not the least sanction of our people. They were sent broadcast by stealing the Review and Herald mailing list. I plainly stated to these fanatic, those fanatical parties that they were doing the work of the adversary of souls. They were in darkness. I there stated in public that the Lord had been pleased to show me that there would be no more definite time in the message given of God since 1844. She kept repeating herself, but there are some who will not listen. Garmeyer said the probation closes October 84. He had a daughter. He thought she had, was having visions. Ellen White wrote a 32-page letter. It would be worth your while to read that 32-page letter to Garmeyer. In that letter is this statement, which we often have heard. Most of that letter was unpublished until 1950, or 
2015. During the past 45 years, Ellen White says in her letter to sist, uh, brother and sister Garmeyer, I have had to meet persons claiming to have messages from God of reproof to others. This phase of religious fanaticism has sprung up again and again since 1844. Let me just stop there. Not only did he have prophetic dates, but he also had you know, visions from God or wisdom from God to rebuke this brother and that brother and, and so forth. The very last deception, Ellen White says here in this letter to Garmeyer, the very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Stop there. I have heard this statement quoted so many times over the years and applied to what I would say are the more liberal, progressive, worldly trends coming into the church. Certainly, those trends do affect the view of the spirit of prophecy and sometimes set them aside. But this statement was written to a fanatical conservative in the context of time setting. And I'm just speaking to camps out there, I guess. If you consider yourself a conservative Adventist, don't think you're free from destroying the testimony, the effect of the testimonies by picking up falsehoods that Ellen White has clearly rebuked. The very last deception will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways and through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. He will bring in spurious visions, so disgust the people that they will regard everything that bears the name vision as a species of fanaticism. 1891. Ellen White has been told she's going to Australia. She's in Michigan. She's getting ready to go to the West Coast to load up, to head off in December to Hawaii and then off to Australia. On the way, she stops at Lansing, camp meeting, and while she's there, there's some issue of time setting again. Again, I would encourage you to read this entire sermon. It was published in the review in March of 1892, about eight months later, in three editions, March 22, March 29, and April 6, I think it is, April 5. It's loaded with helpful advice for us because this was in a time when Ellen White was talking about the loud cry has begun. Notice what she says, a few slides here. Instead of exhausting the powers of our mind in speculations in regard to the times and seasons which the Lord has placed in his own power, we are to yield ourselves to the control of the Holy Spirit. Satan is ever ready to fill the mind with theories and calculations that will divert men from the present truth and disqualify them for the giving of the third angel's message to the world. I've actually seen this. A person that was studying into 1888, seeing truth in it, got off onto time setting, and that has become the total focus. And now at odds with the, the, his local church and so forth. There will never again be a message for the people of God that will be based on time. We are not to know the definite time, either of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit or the coming of Christ. Now, this is interesting. So here she's speaking. She's saying we're not to know the, the time of the outpouring of the Spirit. Why? The Holy Spirit was ready and being poured out in certain settings at that very time, and yet people are looking to a time that the Holy Spirit will be poured out. I think Ellen White is saying, be ready for it now. The third angel's message is swelling into a loud cry, September 1891. And you must not feel at liberty to neglect the present duty and still entertain the idea that at some future time you will be the recipients of a great blessing. Today you are to give yourself to God. That's the point. And of course this was 
what, November 22, 1892, a year after this is when that statement came out in November uh, review, the time of test is just upon us for the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ. Continuing with the statement from her sermon there, I have no specific time of which to speak when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place. Why? When the mighty angel will come down from heaven and unite with the third in closing up the work for this world, my message is that our only safety is in being ready for the heavenly refreshing. Being ready today. Day by day we are to seek the enlightenment of the Spirit of God and that it may do its office work upon the soul and character. If we think it's a time, we'll just show up that day instead of doing the homework which is working with that heavenly priest and preparing our hearts for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We would ask you, what time have you set in which you have determined to give your heart to God without reserve? What time have you set for seeking for perfection of character through faith in the righteousness of Christ? Is it tomorrow? Tomorrow you may be cold in death. This was interesting. There was one guy that set a date that was like three months later and she rebuked him for setting a time off in the future. The point being this very point. You may not be around tomorrow. Today's the day. Do not allow your minds to be diverted from the all-important theme of the righteousness of Christ by the study of theories. And if that was true then, in the midst of the loud cry and the beginning of the latter rain, it surely is true again today. The, our message is that very message that was the message then, that most precious message. And we have read this several times during this weekend, that most precious message sent through elders Wagner's and Jones. Wagner and Jones. I'm going to jump over that because I do, since we are at a 188 conference, I have to quote at least one quote from Wagner and Jones. So what do you think they think about time setting? Here's what Wagner said in 1887. Another time setter who would be nothing if he were not sensational has arisen in New York and declares that the world will come to an end in 19, year 1900. Of course, all his so-called calculations are the most foolish kind of guesswork, for there is absolutely no prophetic period which reaches this side of 1844. But that will not prevent his, this man from finding followers. Here's what Jones said. As is also indicated by the name Seventh-day Adventists are believers in literal, visible second coming of Christ. This event they regard as near, but they hold to no definite time. And yet, because Seventh-day Adventists teach the near coming of Christ, they are repeatedly either ignorantly or, or maliciously charged with the time-setting folly of other bodies of Adventists. Nothing, however, could be farther from the truth. And may it be that it is always farthest from the truth that any of us would get caught up in that kind of movement. Well, I was going to go through a bunch of just summary statements. I, I don't know that I need to say any more. It seems so clear to me that time is no longer. Here's a statement Ellen White made in 1896. She says, The third angel's message is to be sounded by God's people. It is to swell to the loud cry. The Lord has appointed, has a time appointed when he will bind off the work but when is that time? Do you want to know when that time is? When the truth to be proclaimed for the last days shall go forth as a witness to all nations, then shall the end come. If the power of Satan can come into the very temple of God and manipulate things as he pleases, the time of preparation will be prolonged. Here is the secret of the movements made to oppose the men, she's speaking of Jones and Wagner, whom God sent with a message of blessing to, for his people. These men were hated, 
The men and God's message were despised, as verily as Christ himself was hated and despised at his first advent. Men in responsible position have manifest the very attributes of Satan has revealed. If it were possible, the enemy would clog the wheels of the progress and prevent the truths of the gospel from being circulated everywhere. You want to know why we're still here? It's not because there's still some time prophecy that hasn't been fulfilled. It's because God sent a most precious message and we as a people, our fathers, were not ready for that. We have a choice today what we will do with that most precious message, how we will treat it. We're not guilty for their sins, but we repeat them when we fail to acknowledge what has happened. There's much more I wanted to say about the delay there. I believe there has been a delay. We cannot deny there's been a delay. God did not plan on this long period. And every day that goes by is more suffering to him. It's within our power as we surrender to him to end this mess. May that be our choice. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will touch our hearts, Lord. And if there's someone out there that has been caught in these devices of Satan, Lord, I pray you break them free. May we, Lord, lift up that message as never before. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Ron. Uh, As always, much appreciated. Just uh, before we take our break, um, I just want to remind you if there's any questions for any of the speakers from yesterday evening, late afternoon evening, and then any of the speakers today, please submit those. There, uh, anyone online, you can uh, message those to us and those will be getting to us or any, got, those will be brought to us. Or uh, anyone here, just write those out. We'll be uh, starting at back again at 7 o'clock with a question and answer period for a half hour, song service, and then um, Brian Schwartz will be finishing up with a message, the hour of his judgment. Um, also, after um, the evening message, the bookstore will be open here, and uh, that will be tonight. And then um, online, there also all those resources are available online as well. So thank you very much. Are interested in eating supper here? We do have boxed up suppers, and so the same.